If you have your Bibles, would you turn with me to the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 3. We'll look at verse 7. I, I was told years ago that the task of preaching is, is hard enough as it is, that you probably shouldn't try to say you're going to teach on the love of God. Um, but my prayer today is that you would know something about the love of God, that you would experience the love of God, you would feel the love of God in such a way that it would change your lives for the love of God. So if you found Luke chapter 3, verse 7, if you're able, would you stand in honor of reading God's word? Luke chapter 3, verse 7, as we think about the love of God, we read these words. So he began saying to the crowds who were going out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers, who warns you to flee from the wrath to come? Let's pray. Father, this is your word. You have inspired it and preserved it for us. And Father, I ask again that you would help make sense of it in our hearts. Would you help us to do the necessary heart work that is so hard so that we might see your love in glorious ways, ways that perhaps we haven't seen before, perhaps those that are here that have not yet put their trust in you, they've not been born again, would you, would you make these, this verse come alive in their hearts, that they would be moved to repentance, and then they would look and they would see the glory of God and the salvation of God in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Would you change them? Or would you um, empower your, your children to be so moved by your love that we would all go out and want to share the message and plead with people to repent and put their trust in Christ alone? Would you help us? Would you be with others that are preaching the gospel this morning? Would you uh, be with Captain Mitchell as he's preaching on post? Would you give him words to say there? And would you help me? Would you give me words to say here? Would you bring clarity to the hearts of the hearers and make us more like you? And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. You might say, why would you say you're going to talk about the love of God and then talk about bread of vipers and wrath and things like that? It seems like they don't uh, go together, but I would argue they do go together because you can't understand, you're not going to experience or feel the awesome grace of God, the awesomeness of the love of God until you understand something about the exceedingly sinfulness of sin or, or about the horrors of the judgment of God. Last week, we saw in, the, in, the, in Luke 3 that the purpose of John the Baptist's ministry was to prepare the way for the Lord. He was the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecies. In Isaiah chapter 40, he was the fulfillment of the prophecies from Malachi chapter 4. He, was, he is the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. He, um, he wanted people to know that they were sinners and they were in need of a Messiah to be their Savior. They didn't just need to be prepared for a Messiah to come and rule the world politically. They needed a Messiah that would be the savior of their souls. They needed to repent because the coming Messiah was the only one that could save them. That's what he wanted them to see. His ministry was a preparation type ministry. He, um, as I read one author say, his work was like that of a painter who is 
preparing the walls. And so before you paint, you have to do some prep work. You have to sand the walls down and, and have to put some elbow grease into it and sand the walls down to have a good, clean, smooth surface so that the paint will stick. And so John the Baptist preaching was a preparatory ministry, so he was sanding down the walls, sanding down the walls of your heart so that you might be prepared for the Messiah to come so that the gospel of Jesus Christ would stick on your hearts. And that's what I'm praying today, that the gospel would stick. I want you to see three things in verse 7. Number one, I want you to see the crowds come confessing but they come unchanged and unclean. Number, then I want you to take notice of the salutation of his sermon, how he greeted the crowds. And then finally, I want you to consider with me the motivation of his message. Number one, I want you to see the, the crowds are coming to him, but they're coming unchanged and unclean. Look what it says in Luke chapter 3, verse 7. It says, so he began saying to the crowds who were going out to him to be baptized by him. These, there's a crowds of people that are coming to be baptized. These crowds will be there, are multitudes of people coming to the Jordan River. They have heard that there is a stir going on around the Jordan River. There's some crazy guy out there dressed weird, eating weird food, but he's preaching the word, and they are convinced He's a prophet from God. They haven't seen a prophet from God like this in hundreds of years. They've only read about prophets like this. And so they hear about John the Baptist preaching, and they all believe. They are convinced that just John the Baptist has come from God. He's filled with the Holy Spirit of God. He's preaching a message that's coming from God. He's got a word from God, and the word that he's got is Messiah's coming. And the people of Israel, the, the Jewish people in that day, they are excited about it. They think, this is great. We have a prophet. They know about Malachi chapter 4. They know Isaiah chapter 40. And they think, the Messiah is about to come. This is the voice crying in the wilderness. We're ready for the Messiah. And so they're ready. They're, they're confessing that they are believing the Messiah is coming, and they're confessing that they're ready for it. And so if you want me to be baptized, I'll be baptized in the Jordan River. But apparently... In John's day, there were people who wanted to be baptized saying they were ready for the Messiah, but they had not done the necessary heart work to truly be prepared for the Messiah. They were excited. They were happy for the Messiah to come, but their excitement was external. See, just because they came out to be baptized didn't mean they were ready to repent of their sins. It didn't even mean that they were acknowledging their sins. Do you know what they wanted when they, when they came out there? you know what they, were, they wanted from a Messiah? They wanted a military ruler. They were, they were ready for the Messiah to restore the kingdom back to Israel. Their excitement was political. Their excitement was ethnic. They were ready for the Messiah to take care of the government, to take care of the of the. Of the um, of, of the politics, they were ready for the Messiah to take on the Roman Empire, but they were not ready for the Messiah to take on their own hearts. That's the way some churches operate today. Do whatever you can do to get your baptism numbers up. It doesn't matter if there's a real heart change in someone. There are, there are churches, this is becoming a popular thing in our day, where this thing they call spontaneous baptism services. And listen, I know there are some people, there, not everybody, not every church that does this are being led by creeps. There are some godly preachers who want to preach the word who are doing this. I just think they shouldn't. They, 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 they come and they say, we're just going to have a baptism service, and anyone who wants to be baptized, anyone who is professing with their mouths that they're ready for, 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 for Jesus to be the Savior and Lord, then you just come on. we got plenty of shorts in the back. we got plenty of towels. we got plenty of T-shirts. You just come on, and if you're ready to pray a prayer, and we'll get you dunking some water, and we'll get this thing going, and then they'll boast on social media of 30 and 50 and 100 baptisms of those things, and, and, and there's very little preparatory work has been done, very little ministry of the heart that says, hey, have you been changed? You say, well, preacher, when we baptize people, we're baptizing them on their profession of faith. If they profess, and that's all we're really responsible for, we can't be sure of the heart. And that's right, we can't be sure of the heart. But look at what John 
the Baptist says in verses 7 through 9. He says, so he began saying to the crowds who were going out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers, who warns you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore, bear fruits in keeping with repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that from these stones God is able to raise up children to Abraham. Indeed, the axe is already laid at the root of the tree, so every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. You would think that the preparatory work, that if someone is truly prepared for the Messiah, if someone is truly really ready to, to be baptized and to profess Jesus as Lord, either, either in John the Baptist day where they're professing him that they're ready for the Messiah to come, or in our day where they're professing that he has come in their hearts and he's resurrected in their hearts and he's empowered them to live a different life, you would think that if that has happened, there has been repentance that has happened, that, is, that there is at least such a fruit that shows a brokenness over sin. You would think that there would be such a fruit that there would be a changed life to where anybody who ever sees them knows there's a changed life. We ought to be at least responsible for that to make sure has there been a change. They wanted baptism, but they did not want Lord. The crowds wanted the Messiah to be in charge of their nation, to be in charge of their government, but not their souls. Friends, that's the way some of you are. You want Jesus to fix your job. You want him to fix your addiction. You want him to fix the government. You want him to fix the, your marriages, your finance. You want him to be all over your preacher on Sunday morning so he doesn't bore you while he speaks. You want him to be in charge of everything except your lives. You want him as Savior, but not as Lord. There are people who then and now, who are okay with baptism without doing the heart work of surrender. Friends, you can't have him as Savior without having him as Lord. There are oftentimes, you see, you see people who, who maybe, maybe they're battling some kind of addiction and they, they want God to, to, to cure them of their, of their addiction, but they don't want him to cure them over their sexual immorality. They want, there are all kinds of parents who want little Johnny to accept Jesus into their heart, but they do not want little Johnny to really believe that Jesus is more important than sports. They want little Johnny to know that Jesus is Savior, but they want him to be happy. They don't want him to ever feel the weight of sin against a holy and righteous God and to know that they're under the condemnation of God because of their sin. They don't want them feeling that. Don't get all mean, preacher. Friends, you can't have Jesus as Savior without having him as Lord. You, you, that would be like saying, well, I like Daryl, but I don't like Angie. I'm sorry, we're a package deal. You're going to have problems with us. <laughs> By the way, no one in the history of our lives has ever said that. <laughs> they like Daryl, but not Angie. Um, he is always Savior in what? Lord, you cannot receive what he gives without surrendering to who he is. So I want to ask you, have you repented? Have you done the necessary heart work to follow him as Savior and Lord? Have you turned your back on your former lives, your former confidence. If not, why don't you do that now? Second, I want you to notice the salutation of his sermon. Look at how he addresses the crowds coming to be baptized by him. In verses 1 through 6 last week, we understood that the goal of John the Baptist's preaching was to prepare the way of the Lord. Again, Kind of like a prep work of a painter so that the paint of the gospel will actually stick. Get people ready for the good news of the gospel. He wanted people to see the glory of the Lord. Now, now we know that was the goal of his message, but we didn't know what his content would be. Like, we didn't know, uh, Pastor Brad, we didn't know what, uh, what, his, what his homiletical style was going to be to get his point across. 
Um, verses 7 through 9, we get how he greets the crowd. Look at verse 7. So he began saying to the crowds who were going out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers. Now that's a greeting, isn't it? Uh, now, now to be fair, Matthew's account of this story, Matthew chapter 3, says that, uh, that, he's, that there are Pharisees and Sadducees in this crowd. And so he's telling these religious leaders who are they're just hypocrites, he's telling them, uh, he's calling them brood of vipers. But, um, but, but the, uh, when, when he preaches to the other crowds, like other crowds, he's much more soft sermons. He just says things like, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Uh, but, but Luke's gospel here, Luke says there's crowds coming to him. Like this is a multitude of people that are coming out to the Jordan River to hear John the Baptist preach and to be baptized. And, and he's, it's, like he spe- it's like this is his introductory salutation of his sermon. It's like when I send a one call on the phone tree and I say, good morning, living hope. I pray you're doing well. <laughs> or when First and Second Corinthians, the Apostle Paul writes, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. John the Baptist opening salutation is, good morning, you brother vipers. Repent, you children of serpents. I mean, it's a brood of vipers. It's literally saying you offspring of serpents. You sons of Satan. That's what he's saying. The devil is called a snake all over the Bible. In Genesis 3, the devil appears as a serpent in the garden. At the end of the Bible, in Revelation 12, the serpent is revealed as the devil of old. John is making a judgment on their character by calling them the same thing that Jesus calls them in John chapter 8, verse 44, children of the devil. What's the point he's making? He's talking to Jewish people, religious people, He's telling them that their way they do religion is false. And so a point that he's making is false. And friends, we need to hear this. False religion is more of a repellent than atheism. Nothing, when he calls them serpents, sons of serpents, He's telling them as far as the work of God goes, they are like poisonous, destructive vipers. Nothing can clear a room quicker than when a snake shows up. Isn't that true? Like, look, most people, when they see a snake, I mean most people. I'm there. Some of y'all are freaks, I know. So don't, don't come telling me how you like playing with them. I, but most people who have any sense, they don't want nothing to do with snakes. Snakes show up and they, they scatter, right? They don't want nothing to do with those things. I remember when Angie and I... First got married, 20 years old. We had a house that was on my father-in-law's farm, and rent was cheap, and, but the house was falling apart. Like, there was one part of the house that, like, the, the floor was gone, and the roof and ceiling was caved in. But we just, we, Angie called that the scary room. We just let that be, and <laughs> we lived on the other part. But right next to the scary room, there was another room that we did kind of fix up, and we put a closet in there, and my clothes went in there because... We didn't have a lot of closet space. And so there was one morning, I was 20 years old. Angie is in the bathroom getting ready. She was finishing up her senior year of college. She's getting ready to leave. And I go to, the, to get to that, to that other room next to the scare room to get my clothes out of the closet. And as I'm walking out, there's like we had these milk crates. that had like trophies and yearbooks and like shorts and things that were kind of put on the on those milk crates, as, I, as I'm walking out, I just, I catch something out of the corner of my eye after I got my clothes, and I walk, and I come back, and I look in, and there's a snake coiled up on a pair of my shorts. And I look, there's only like six kinds of snakes I'm scared of, like real ones, fake ones, <laughs> dead ones, living ones, poisonous ones, non-poisonous ones, that's it. And so I'm looking at this snake, and I'm thinking, I'm, I'm telling you, I thought, maybe if I just leave when I come back, it'll be gone. <laughs> and I thought, 
that thing would be in my bed as sure as I'm standing here. And so I'm thinking, Daryl, you're 20 years old. You're a man. You got you to man up and kill that snake. And I'm like, no, I ain't killing that snake. I'm having this little dialogue in my mind, and my wife sees me from the bathroom just standing there looking. She said, what are you doing? I said, I'm thinking. And she said, what are you thinking about? I said, how am I going to get rid of the snake? And she said, oh, no, do you want me to call Dad? I said, no, I don't want you to call Dad. I'm a grown man. It's my house. I'll take care of that stinking snake. And so we had our heat in that house was like a stokermatic coal heater. And so we had like a little barn that had coal in it and a shovel. And so I'll go out there to get that shovel. I said, I'm going to kill that snake. And so I'm going out, and I'm thinking, I'll be fighting mad if she calls her dad. But deep down, I was like, man, I hope she calls her dad. <laughs> And I come back in with that shovel, and I'm thinking, I don't know, how, how am I going to rake this thing off and then go to chopping it? What am I going to do? Am I going to break the crates? And, and so I walk in, and she said, look, I know I, I, I just got called down. Oh, I was so mad at her outwardly. <laughs> but inwardly, I was like, praise the Lord for a wise wife. I wanted to run. Snakes are repellents. In, in the 90s, when, that, when everybody else was paying 7 or $8 an hour to cut tobacco in Kirkmansville on Rattlesnake Road, they were paying $18 an hour, and nobody wanted to do it. Those of you here that are hypocrites, who don't live in the power of the gospel, I, I want you to hear this. I'm not talking about the things that you do or don't do as much as I'm talking about how you act like you love Jesus on Sundays. But in your heart, Monday through Saturday, there's no treasuring of him whatsoever. And it's obvious to everyone around you. I want you to know that you're not limiting the power of the gospel by your hypocrisy. That's an impossibility. But by your hypocrisy, you're destroying the gospel altogether. Does your Christianity make people wonder about the hope that lies within you? Does it make people laugh at your Christianity? I'm not trying to get too much into your business. But I do want you to think just consider the people that you're around on a daily basis, the people you work with. Does your Christianity make them want to come to church with you? Does it make them laugh at your church? Does your Christianity make your kids want to know more about Jesus? Or does your Christianity tell your kids, no, this stuff is really real? False religion is like a viper. It's crafty, dangerous, and destructive. Snakes are subtle and crafty animals, Genesis 3.1 says. They're even wise, Matthew 10.16 says. But make no mistake about it, they present clear and present danger. They hide and they strike without warning. You have seen and you have heard of how charlatan preachers, like TV preachers, like Benny Hinn and Jim Baker and the, the list could go on and on, how they tell, spew out their venom and lies of saying that God wants you to be healthy and wealthy and prosperous in exchange for your money into their ministries while they fly the world in their private jets, shipwrecks the faith of people. But maybe what's more dangerous than them are the local wolves in sheep clothing. Real conversations I've had over 17 years of pastoring. One guy said, I used to go to church. as even a treasurer in a church. And the pastor took advantage of the money and stole a bunch of money and the church split and I haven't been back to church in 20 years. Shipwrecked his faith. I was knocking on doors one time and a guy said, I used to go to church. The pastor slept with my wife and took her. 
I don't want anything to do with that kind of religion. If I go back to church, are you going to take my wife I got now? Shipwrecks faith, destroys communities. One, and perhaps the most dangerous vipers are the ones that are in the pews. They might be sitting next to you and you don't know it. They look the part. They speak Christianese. They own a study Bible. But during the week, they're foul-mouthed, slanderous, lazy. They objectify women. They gossip about co-workers and men. They steal. They lie. And when the people find out that they go to church, they laugh and mock. They can clear out a room quicker than a rattlesnake. Is that you? I'm, I'm not making judgments. I'm asking you, is that you? And if it's you, why? Why do you do that? Why do, you, why do you even call yourself a Christian? H has it always been that way? Was there ever a time where you were broken over sin and you, and, and you knew that you were lost and undone? Did you ever have any joy? Were you always like this? Why do you do that? Why, like, did you ever, were you ever broken over sin? Did you ever know the weight of your sin? Did you ever know that you were hopeless and, and without God and your only hope was if Jesus comes down and rescues you? Did you, ever, did you ever taste that? And if you did, how did you become like this? Why do you do that? Why don't you stop? Why are you like that? Or as John the Baptist asked, who warns you to flee from the wrath to come? Finally, I want you to consider with me the motive of his message. Friends, you may be uncomfortable with this type of preaching. You're supposed to be uncomfortable with this type of preaching. Because before before you can be healed, you have to know you're broken. John's motivation is that these crowds be healed. There's a principle in the Bible that's law to the proud and grace to the humble. If someone comes broken and they're broken of their sin and they feel hopeless, they don't need to be called brother vipers and told. They just need to tell there's a Savior that has come and lived and died and rose. If you'll look to him, you'll be saved. But to the religious proud, to the good people, they need their legs taken out from under them so that they know they have nothing to stand on but the solid rock of Christ. Remember his motivation. You can look back. We see three, at least three motivations he has of his message. Look at verse 3. Here's his motivation. And he came into all the district around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. That's what he's motivated that's what's driving his preaching. He wants you to experience the forgiveness of sins. Like this is, this is the danger of me preaching a message like this, is that there's been a lot of harsh things that said. Maybe it's a little bit, you might think it's a little bit borderline mean, and you think, I ain't going back to it. Maybe, maybe you checked out a long time ago because you think it's just too, it's a typical hellfire brim. It's not typical anymore. 
You might just say, that's just that old Baptist preacher, that hellfire brim. So I was like, listen, don't check out. Because the goal of it is that you can know, and this is as bold of a statement as we can say, your sins can be forgiven. That's what John the Baptist is preaching like this story. He wants people to know you can be forgiven. You can live in the freedom that when you stumble, and you will stumble, that when you stumble, you don't have to stay down. You can get up, you can repent again, and you can run back to the Savior, embrace the forgiveness he's given you and he's purchased for you on the cross, and you get right back in and persevere all the way to the end. You can do that. He wants you to live in the forgiveness of sins that the Messiah can accomplish for you. And so in order to do that, he's got to make sure that you know you got a disease. You are sin sick even if you don't see the symptoms, even if you're not buying it yet. He wants you to see God's grace in Jesus defines you, not your sin. A forgiveness that will show the world that your repentance is more notorious than your sin. He wants you to know, he wants you to experience the forgiveness of sins. That's his motivation. Another motivation he has is in verse 6, all flesh will see the salvation of God. He wants you to see the glory of the Lord. And you might say, well, what's the difference between being forgiven and, and seeing the salvation of God? Well, maybe there's not much, but, but I think being forgiven by God is a state that you are in accomplished by Christ. But seeing the salvation of God, seeing it is you are seeing it and you're loving what you see. You're beholding the Savior, and you're savoring what you behold. Like you see the salvation of God, and you want to keep seeing it more. Like you remember, I can't speak for the ladies, but like guys, do you remember when you first met your wife? When you first realized that you were attracted to her, and you would, maybe you would see her, maybe you were in school, maybe you were at a wherever, y'all's business. But anyway, you saw her and you couldn't take your eyes off of her. You just saw that beauty and you just wanted to keep seeing it. So maybe she turns her head and your eyes make contact and you turn your head away like, like you wasn't looking. You see the beauty You just want to keep seeing it. I think that's something like when you see the salvation of God, you just want to fix your eyes on Him. I get to the office early most mornings because it's just good study time. Sometimes I get here and I'll have prayer. I've got this little little button in my office. It's like a... um, you remember those easy buttons that they would have on commercials like the Office Max stuff? It's like an easy button. I've got this little, I think Lynn Farmer gave it to me. Um, it's a little easy. It's like a, it's like a cross button. It's just a little button. sits on my desk. Every now and then I'll slap it and I'll say, praise the Lord. <laughs> It'll wake you up sometime. When I get to the office early and I'm studying, I usually have prayer time first and um, and as I, and usually that wakes me up, but sometimes I'm still a little bit tired, and I start studying, I'm writing, and I'm, you know, I'm underlining words, I'm saying, okay, what does this word mean? I'm doing, I'm, I'm doing, I'm preparing, I'm studying, because you want your preacher to study. And uh, I'm, I'm studying, and sometimes I'm like, I'm, I'm still sleepy, and I'm about to doze off, but it never fails. Almost every day, at some point in the studying, there's something that pops up. And my eyes just light up, and I see something glorious of the salvation of my God. And I just put the pen down, and sometimes a tear will come to my eyes. Sometimes I just sit and smile and just gaze on the glory of the Lord and what I've just seen. And I slap the button, praise the Lord, and I just worship. 
It's in those moments when I'm in awe of his love for me that it's not that I just feel like I'm a child of his, but I feel like I'm his favorite. That's the motivation of John's preaching. He's going to say hard things that they might sting and they might hurt. But he wants you to see the glory of the Lord in such a way that you'll say, praise the Lord. I'm his. I'm even, sometimes I think I'm his favorite. That's his motivation. He wants you to see it. He has another motive in his message, verse 18. It's what he says. It says, so with many other exhortations, he preached the gospel to the people. So he says, brood of vipers, who warns you to flee from the wrath to come? He says hard things. When he preaches it and when the elders here preach it, none of us are preaching it in a way because we just want to get points for being bold. None of us are preaching it in a way because we just want to be jerks or meanies. And we preach it in such a way that we're longing, that we're desiring to make sense of the gospel. We can't preach the gospel without preaching sin. And so you preach sin in big, bold letters so that the gospel of the grace of Jesus Christ can be coming out even bigger and bolder letters. He, he's not preaching just to be a jerk or just to be a meanie or just to, uh, like, he's not, he, like, we don't want you to just to hear me say about you're just a bunch of brood of vipers and a bunch of nasty sinners and you don't do this right and you don't do that right. We're not, like, I don't want you to leave here just motivated to say, you know, I'm going to try harder this week. I'm going to work harder. I'm going to give more money to the church. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to volunteer in some of that stuff they're talking about doing. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go do these things. I'm going to work harder. I'm going to try harder. Man, that paint won't stick long. Now we preach it in a way that we're taking your legs out from under you. So you say, I'm just in need of a Savior. I'm in need of a Messiah to come and rescue me. We want to preach it in a way so that we can say, the gospel has come. Gee, like, isn't that what John the Baptist like? He's preaching, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, so that when the Messiah shows up, he can say, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That's what he's aiming at. That's what he's going after. He wants you to see the gospel. The Messiah is coming. When you know your sin and you know that you did it to yourself, and there's nothing you can do about it, and you know you deserve judgment, and then you hear that Jesus has come, and he's lived perfectly, and he's died a death in your place to pay for all of your sins. He rose from the grave so that you can be forever forgiven and saved and a child of God. Oh, then you'll see the glory of the Lord. To which you might say, well, then why don't you just say that? Why you got to do all that wrath talk? Why don't you just say, Jesus came and he lived and he died and he rose. And, to, and if you'll invite him into your heart, you'll be saved. Why don't you just say that? You can do all that brood of viper junk. Because in order to be forgiven, you need not only to know that you're a sinner, you need to be broken over your sin. Do you think anyone is really going to be broken over sin if you just come and say, well, you know, you know you're a sinner, right? I mean, everybody's a sinner. We just come in and say, hey, you know, Romans 3, 23, all of sin comes for the glory of God. It's no big deal. Everybody's done it. You think that's going to break anybody? That they'll long for a Savior? That paint won't stick. We come and we preach. Like you preach the sinfulness of humans, rut of vipers. You preach the judgment of God. Wrath of God is coming. 
then maybe you'll be sitting on edge longing to hear a gospel of good news that will rescue you. September 16th, 2020, my dad's birthday. And we had to go to an oncologist appointment because they said that they had found a spot on my mom and they wanted to talk about it. So we went in and the doctor came in and, and she didn't say, like the doctor didn't say, she didn't come in and say, well, you know, you've got a little spot on your pancreas, but you know, don't worry. Everybody's got, a lot of people have them. It's not, it's not uncommon for people to have that. It's okay. Don't worry about it. If she just said that, we might have left thinking everything was somewhat normal and we had a birthday party. She didn't say that. She came in and she said, Miss Crawford, you have pancreatic cancer, and you need to get your affairs in order. If you do nothing, you have a few months to live. And if you do something, you've got a few more months to live. Here's our plan. Now, she ruined my dad's birthday, <laughs> for sure. But her directness helped us understand the seriousness of the disease. You think we were listening closely to what that plan was? So longing to hear that there is a cure. There was no cure for my mom's disease. Friends, there's a cure for your disease. You're infected with the disease of sin. You've broken his laws, you violated his commandments. Because of that, if God, since God is just, he must punish. But there's a cure for your disease. Jesus has come. He has lived perfectly. He has died sacrificially, meaning he dies in your place. All of your sin he took on himself. And then all of the judgment that you deserve, he drank up so that you could be declared right. He rose from the grave so that you could be eternally a child of God. That's the cure. So run to him. Friends, when John the Baptist says, you brood of vipers, who warns you to flee from the wrath to come? He's not trying to offend them. He's trying to break them. He's not trying to be a jerk. He's, he's not trying just to get them prepared to see the Messiah as an emperor. He wants them to see Messiah as a savior. He doesn't want them just to see the Messiah as the king of Israel. He wants them to see the Messiah as the king of all kings and the Lord of all lords. wants them to know that for them to be accepted by the Messiah, for you to be accepted by the Christ, you got to repent. you got to run to him in absolute surrender. John the Baptist wants you to forsake your former confidences. Their confidence was in their religion. Their confidence was in their pedigree. Confidence might be in your money or in your own goodness. If that's your confidence, you'll never see Jesus. So forsake your former religion. Forsake your former confidence. Forsake your former lives. And surrender to Jesus as Savior and Lord. When I read the story of John the Baptist doing the preparatory work like a painter, I conclude with this quote. I do not offer you some slick, external, religious paint job. I challenge you to bring the house of your life to Jesus Christ and have him come and dwell in it. And the power of the Holy Spirit will transform you in such a way that you will bear fruit of such repentance. Amen. 
can I ask you, did you ever truly repent? Have you ever come to an end of yourself and truly repent and long for a Savior? Have you done that? Why don't you do it now? Can you honestly say, You have turned your life over to Jesus. Turn from sin. Will you do it now? Let's pray. Father, I pray that people aren't just hearing harsh stuff today. I pray that they are hearing There is a Savior that has come and has had done all the things that are necessary to bring salvation to their souls. Lord, I pray for the Christians here who may be struggling. Maybe they've taken their eyes off of the glory of the Lord. Help them to repent and pick themselves up and enable them to walk in their forgiveness and walk in their redemption. For those who are in awe of your glory and all of your and all of your grace and are worshiping you in their spirit because of how you have saved them, would you help them to pray for loved ones who are dying and lost and have not repented yet? Would you make us a praying people? Would you make us to live upright before the people around us so that they might wonder about our hope? Father, for those that have never been born again. Would you help them to see that the blood of Jesus, would you help them to see that their lives, would you help them even to feel the flames that are singed with fires of hell they would run to you and be soaked in the blood of Jesus. Help them to cause them to repent. Show them your glory. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.